Museum of the Prefecture of Police in Paris showcases the most amazing collection of artifacts in France's history of crime. The spy hole through which Dr. Petio watched his victims agonize. The thin rope used to strangle bailiff Gouffe. Landru's boiler. Knives, revolvers, and truncheons. All these weapons were used to commit the most heinous crimes. Since the 19th century, the police has relied on science to solve its investigations. Anthropometry, the study of the human iris, graphology, and morphopsychology are used. Daniel Thierry, police commissioner and seasoned investigator, takes us to the very heart of history's most sensational criminal investigations. Le 22 août 1933, à l'heure du dîner, Violette Nozière fait avaler à ses parents une forte dose de somnifère. Puis, elle s'en va danser. Le lendemain soir, elle rentre et trouve ses parents inanimés. Elle ouvre le gaz et s'en va alerter les voisins en criant que ses parents se sont suicidés. Qu'est-ce qui a bien pu pousser cette jeune fille de 18 ans à commettre l'irréparable Et pourquoi son histoire a autant fasciné l'opinion publique et les intellectuels du quartier Lata. Nine rue Madagascar, in the 12th arrondissement of Paris, seemed very calm this fateful Wednesday, August 23, 1933. It's 2 a.m. when René Mayol hears an insistent knocking on the door of his fifth floor apartment. Woken from a deep sleep, he finds his neighbor from the sixth floor, Violette Nozière, in the corridor. She's in a complete panic. Come quick, she says. I can smell gas in my parents' apartment. He rushes out of the door and notices a strong gas smell in the corridor. Inside the apartment, the atmosphere is suffocating, and he's careful not to put on the light in case it causes an explosion. He feels his way to the window and opens it wide. Next, he heads into the kitchen and cuts off the gas at the source. A few minutes later, when the room has aired out, he finally turns on the ceiling light and a scene of horror unfolds before his eyes. Germaine Nozier, Violette's mother, lay still on the bed. The sheets are covered in blood. Violette feels ill, so Mayol takes her back to his apartment and then goes down to see the concierge, Madame Bourdon, as she has a telephone and they need to call the authorities. They all go back upstairs to the Nozier's apartment to look for Baptiste, Violette's father, it doesn't take them long, as his body is in the living room on Violette's bed, and he too is soaked in blood. When the firemen arrive, they can only confirm that Baptiste is indeed dead, but Germaine is still breathing weakly, and she's taken straight to Saint Antoine Hospital. Everyone agrees it must have been an attempt at suicide by gas. The police arrive at the apartment not long after, and they too are sure that suicide is the most likely explanation. Violette seems to be terribly distressed. She's young, only 18 years old. Why did they kill themselves? She demands with tears in her eyes. When Captain Goudet arrives a little later, he begins a careful search of the apartment and discovers Madame Nozier's accounts book, where she scrupulously notes all of the house's expenses. There is nothing written for the day of the 22nd of August, and the captain deduces that they decided to kill themselves on the 22nd. I think that's an interesting thing. 
This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. The policeman makes another observation in comparing his reading of the gas meter with the last reading. And he realizes that not very much gas has been used. He's surprised and wonders... How is it possible for so little gas to have escaped from a valve that has been open for several hours? Si le gaz avait été ouvert depuis 12 heures, il y aurait déjà eu une grosse accumulation de gaz dans l'appartement, dans l'ensemble de l'immeuble. Ça aurait senti, les gens s'en seraient aperçus, et puis probablement aussi que euh, il y aurait eu une explosion. Ce que les pompiers euh, disent dans un premier temps, c'est que il y a très peu de gaz, que le gaz est très rapidement dissipé, et que en l'occurrence Dans la deuxième phase des constatations, sur le corps de Monsieur Nozière, qui lui est, à, est allongé dans le, dans le vestibule, on constate qu'il y a des vomissures un peu partout dans l'appartement, ce qui peut être une indication, non pas d'un suicide au gaz, mais d'un suicide à autre chose. Très vite, on va se dire comment une personne qui est morte depuis plus de 12 heures a pu ouvrir le gaz entre temps pour se suicider. The captain has some doubts. He asks Violette to come to the station at three o'clock. We're going to the hospital to see your mother, he tells her. At St. Antoine Hospital, the doctors quickly realize that Madame Nozier is suffering from acute poisoning from a chemical substance. However, the blood analysis shows a complete absence of carbon monoxide so it's not gas poisoning that's causing Germaine Nozier's coma. When Captain Goudet arrives at the hospital with Violette, he asks to see Madame Nozier. The doctor explains he can see her, but that she cannot speak at the moment. The captain asks Violette to wait for him in the guard's office, whilst he goes in, but when he comes back a few minutes later, the young girl has disappeared. Why did Violette leave in such a haste? Does she have something to hide? Her disappearance sows the seed of doubt in Captain Goudet's mind. That afternoon, he returns to the hospital, accompanied this time by the public prosecutor and Dr. Paul. Madame Nozier comes out of her coma, but she's confused. The magistrate asks her to try to remember what happened with some difficulty, Madame Nozier tells him about the night of August 21st, 1933. After dinner, she and her husband took some medicine that Violette gave them. There were three little pouches containing white powder. She thought it was strange how insistent Violette was that they take the entire contents. Violette herself took some medicine from a pouch marked with a black cross. They swallowed the mixture even though it was very bitter. In fact, it was so bitter that Germaine only managed to drink half of it, which is what saved her life. A few minutes later, Jean-Baptiste collapsed in the living room and Germaine asked Violette to help her get him to lay down on her bed. Once they had done that, she also fell ill, hitting her head hard on the bedpost as she did so. She tells the captain that they didn't try to commit suicide at all. No doubt remains in the policeman's mind. Violette Nozier poisoned her parents. A new element of the case may help confirm this theory. Dr. Paul performs an autopsy on the bottle of Baptiste Nozier. He sends the blood samples to the police's toxology lab. The director of the lab, Professor Emile Conabrest, will handle the analysis personally. Professeur Conabrest, alors directeur du laboratoire, procède à l'analyse des viscères de Baptiste Nozière. 
Il extrait les poisons des viscères par une technique qu'on appelle méthode d'extraction de stas autologier, qui est une technique encore utilisée actuellement pour l'extraction des poisons dans les viscères. Et il va identifier à l'issue de cette analyse du véronal, donc qui est un barbiturique, et euh, il va le doser et conclure en fait, euh, qu'il a été retrouvé en quantité suffisante pour provoquer la mort de M. Nozière. The levels in his blood were equivalent to taking between 18 to 24 sleeping pills, a fatal dose for someone with kidney and liver damage like Baptiste. Violette Nozière is guilty, but where is she? The young girl has vanished. The press gets hold of the story on August 23rd. Initially, Violette is presented as a poor victim, a young girl of just 18 who came home to tragedy. But soon they change their tune. On August 24th, after learning that prosecutors have opened a murder inquiry and that the judge Edmund Lenoir has indicted Violette for the murder of her father, Baptiste Nozier, and attempted murder of her mother, Germaine Nozier. And that the famous Captain Guillaume is in charge of the investigation. The papers go after Violette with a vengeance. The headlines are sensational. Monster in a petticoat hunted by police. The infamous Violette Nozier and her crime. The girl's photograph is splashed on all the front pages with the headline, Punt in the Latin Quarter for the Parent Killer. The search is in full swing. An alert has been sent out to all of France's police stations and international borders to find Violette. But the police are keeping an especially close eye on the Latin Quarter of Paris, somewhere Violette is known to frequent. Violette Nozière, c'était une lycéenne qui avait 18 ans. C'était une fille unique, adulée par ses parents. Ils l'appelaient leur gentille chérie, leur vilaine chérie, leur princesse chérie. C'était une fille à qui ils ne pouvaient absolument rien refuser. Ils l'avaient inscrite. Dans le, à l'époque, les lycées n'étaient pas mixtes. Et le meilleur lycée public pour les jeunes filles était le lycée Fénelon, en plein quartier latin. Très vite, elle sèche les cours, elle invente les euh, prétextes les plus divers, les moins vraisemblables, pour, eh bien, pour aller perdre son temps. D'abord au cinéma, ensuite elle court les cafés, et elle s'y fait des amis de plus ou moins... Euh, de plus ou moins bonne qualité, et je dirais que c'est à partir de là, dans les années 1930-1931, alors qu'elle n'a encore que 16 ans, c'est là que commence sa dérive. On August 28, five days after the crime was discovered, Captain Guillaume receives a visit from a young man named André de Pinguet. He tells him that earlier that day he met a young girl calling herself Christiane d'Arfeuille, but who strongly resembled Violette Nozière. He's supposed to meet her again that evening at 8.30 on the terrace of a brasserie called Bière Brune, situated at the corner of Avenue Montpiquet and Avenue Bosquet. There's not a minute to lose. Captain Guillaume sends his men to the brasserie. At exactly 8.30, Violette exits the metro station École Militaire, heading for her rendezvous. But two policemen suddenly appear and arrest the girl before she can go inside. Violette is not surprised. She knew this would happen. She only hoped that she would be free a little longer. She's driven to the Quai des Orfèvres, to the Homicide Bureau, where she finds herself in the office of Captain Guillaume. The policeman doesn't have the right to interview her until the judge arrives. But Guillaume is an excellent and very perceptive detective. He senses that Violette is ready to confess, so he begins talking to her. Their exchange marks him profoundly. It is even included in his memoirs. Violette was slouched down in the chair in front of my desk, with her head buried in the fur collar of her coat, why did you do it, he asked. 
She told him that her father had abused her when her mother was away, and she had not dared to tell her because she had been too scared. Dès son arrestation, Violette a donné une, un mobile très clair en expliquant que son père abusait d'elle depuis qu'elle avait 12 ans. Ça, ce sont les termes hein, du, euh, de l'interrogatoire. Et puis, elle a détaillé. Donc, elle a accusé son père de l'avoir violée et d'avoir entretenu avec elle des relations sexuelles pendant 6 euh, ans. Et elle explique avoir voulu se venger donc, euh, de son père, qui avait fini par la dégoûter à partir du moment où elle avait commencé à avoir des amants, c'est-à-dire à, à l'âge de 16 ans. She's still confiding in him when the judge enters the office. Mr. Guillaume, you shouldn't be interrogating this person, he says sternly. It's grounds for dismissal. It's 11.55 when Judge Edmund Lenoir opens case 811, the Nozier case, and officially starts his interrogation. You have the right to ask for a lawyer, he says. But you are also free to make your statement now, if you prefer. I prefer to explain now, responds Violette. It was me that on August 21st made my parents take a white powder. It was the strong sleeping pill called Veronal. I bought three tubes and I crushed them up and spilt the powder into little pouches and I made them drink the mixture. After recording her first confession, the judge asks that the accused be taken to jail. At 9 Rue Madagascar, the police continue their investigation in the apartment. On the sideboard in the kitchen, they find a sealed letter to one Jean Dabin. In the letter, Violette asks the young man to tell her parents that he wants to marry her. On the table in the living room, the investigators find three little pouches that contain the infamous powder. One is marked with a cross. The pouches are sent to the police toxology lab. The connection is clear. The two gray-blue pouches contain the Veronal, mixed with a bit of starch. That proves that the powder is indeed crushed up tablets. The third white sachet marked with the cross is empty and it contains no traces of Veronal. Everything substantiates Violette's confession that she had crushed the sleeping pills up and given them to her parents. The last little pouch contains some inoffensive powder that she took in front of them to persuade them to take theirs. But who is Jean Dabin? The inspectors investigate and learn about him. He's a young man from a good family. He's been close friends with Violette and her group for a while, and they've often been seen together in the Latin Quarter. Le quartier latin, à l'époque, c'était un grand village. Tout le monde connaissait tout le monde. Les ragots tout, euh, circulaient sur les uns et sur les autres. Et fin juin 1933, l'ami d'un ami d'un ami lui présente un étudiant en droit nommé Jean Dabin. L'étudiant pas très pressé de, de passer ses diplômes, un étudiant qui traîne un petit peu comme Violette Nozière, il accumule les bonnes fortunes, il accumule une vie paresseuse et désœuvrée dans les cafés du quartier latin et de temps en temps il va faire un tour à la faculté de droit. Lui et Violette se rencontrent et Comme dans les romans, c'est une histoire d'amour qui commence. Pendant les quelques semaines que va durer leur liaison, eh bien, elle se croira au paradis. Le problème, c'est que pour Jean Dabin, Violette Nozière, c'est une bonne fortune parmi pas mal d'autres, une fille pour laquelle il n'a pas de sentiment particulier, et surtout une fille dont il va profiter. Worried about losing her lover, Violette began to pretend she was wealthy. 
Jean Dabin, qui déteste pas profiter des, des situations, se fait financer non seulement le café, le restaurant, le cinéma, l'hôtel, mais également ses costumes, son habillement. L'enquête révélera qu'elle lui avait versé plus de 1000 francs, c'est-à-dire le salaire de l'ouvrier moyen de l'époque. We start to see what it was that pushed Violette to commit her crime. In August, Judge Lenoir summons Jean de Bain. He confirms that he sees Violette often, and that she told him that she worked in a fashion company, and that her father had a high-up job in the famous railway company Paris-Lyon-Marseille, or PLM. She regularly gives him money, but he doesn't see anything wrong with accepting, seeing as he believes her to be rich. His behavior is inelegant, but not reprehensible. The day of the murder, Jean de Bain was at his uncle's in Brittany, so there is no reason to detain him. But the press and public opinion picture him as a gigolo, and it will end up causing him a lot of problems. First, he's kicked out of his university and has to give up his studies. Then, his family accuses him of having sullied their name. What's a boy to do? He decides to leave and joins a regiment based in Tunisia, where he'll fall sick and never return. The Nozier family are not rich. Violette's father did indeed work at PLM, but as a train driver. And he was so good that it was him who in fact drove the famous Pacific 231, which pulled the presidential train. Her parents were of modest means, but they had always cherished their daughter. Yet, in the little two-room apartment on Rue de Madagascar, Violette is suffocating. Elle est étouffée, ce qui fait c'est la raison pour laquelle elle a songé à, 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 à échapper à ce climat qu'elle ne supportait plus. D'où ses fugues au bout d'un moment, d'où ses fugues au quartier latin. Elle partait le soir euh, euh, tout doucement euh, à pas feutré après avoir euh, fait sa petite belote avec son papa et sa maman. Et elle partait euh, euh, comme ça et elle rejoignait ses, ses compagnes du quartier latin où elle faisait la fête, euh, complètement la fête. Hein, elle, elle était, c'est ce que l'appellerait aujourd'hui une, une femme libérée. Elle était plus, plus que libérée. Violette wanted to be the young, rich woman, careless and without any problems, that she had invented in the Latin Quarter. She wanted to buy the fine dresses, coats and jewelry that she saw shining in the windows of the fancy shops. C'était une mythomane. Elle, un jour, elle disait à ses, à ses amis qu'elle était fille d'un général, un autre que son père était millionnaire, un autre qu'il était ingénieur au PLM, au, la, la compagnie de chemin de fer. Et pour tenir son rang, eh bien, il fallait qu'elle, plus souvent qu'à son tour, c'était elle qui payait les tournées dans les cafés, qui payait le cinéma, le restaurant, etc. C'était un tempérament généreux. On peut dire ça à sa, à sa décharge. She needs money to satisfy her desires. First, she steals from her parents, then from shops. She goes even further. She poses naked for artistic photos, but she doesn't stop there. She also sells her body. Elle était un peu portée sur les messieurs très rassis, qui étaient un petit peu avides de serre fraîche, vous voyez. Alors elle voulait bien donner sa serre fraîche, mais contre des euh, monnaies sonnantes et, et trébuchantes. Sur son parcours, c'était en général les grands, les grands boulevards. Il y avait des messieurs qui se promenaient comme ça, un peu esselés. Et voilà. Bon, c'est la prostitution, si on veut, mais enfin, c'était pas euh, tous les jours, c'était pas systématique. Why did Violette lead this double life? Nothing in her childhood could have predicted this tragedy. She was adored by her mother and had a pleasant life without problems. 
She was a good student who passed her school certificate at 12 years old. Mature beyond her years, at 13 she looks like 16 and starts to take an interest in boys. In 1927, she resumes her studies at the Sophie Germain School. She also starts meeting boys, as the Charlemagne Boys High School is just around the corner. Her behavior becomes more and more shocking. In June 1931, the principal of her school tells Violette not to come back the following year. The class committee is unanimous proclaiming her to be lazy, backstabbing, hypocritical, shameless, and a deplorable example to her classmates. The Nozier's neighbors won't allow their daughters to spend time with this tramp, and Violette only has one true friend, Madeleine de Bise, Maddie, with whom she lives the wild life. However, the audacious young girl is completely different with her parents. She's tender and affectionate with her mother and considerate to her father. She spends long evenings with them. When her mother is busy with housework, her father and her play backgammon, which he loves. And then their apparent happiness is shattered by Violette's senseless act. By September 1933, everything has changed. When she sees her mother and begs forgiveness on her knees, her mother responds, I'll forgive you when you're dead. Germaine Nozier, who had so completely adored her daughter, vows eternal hatred. The accusations of incest that Violette makes about her father do not help things. Germaine is the accuser, and in the trial, she'll be on the opposite side of her daughter. Nineteen thirty-three, the economic crisis is in full swing, and poverty is everywhere in France. In Germany, Hitler has seized power. In France, the Nozier case makes the headlines. The press are reporting her terrible accusations against her father. In the court of public opinion, there are two camps, those who are convinced it was parricide and those offended by the incest claims. Il me semble que tout l'intérêt de cette affaire criminelle est dans cette question de l'inceste. Alors, comment a été reçue cette parole accusatrice du père. Eh bien, eh bien c'est une indignation unanime hein, qui a accueilli ces propos. Et on voit, quand on lit le corpus de presse, on voit l'étendue du tabou, hein, de l'inceste. Il ne faut pas en parler, et donc ça n'existe pas. Et donc la parole de Violette Nozière, elle est jugée monstrueuse. À la fois, elle a commis un crime monstrueux, et sa parole est jugée monstrueuse. Et finalement, euh, elle redouble le parricide. C'est comme si elle tuait son père une, une seconde fois. Those convinced of her guilt are more numerous, and when she arrives at the court to come before Judge Lenoir, she's subjected to a crowd screaming insults. They're on the verge of hysteria, and they yell, Death for Violette. Et je pense que il faut vraiment mesurer euh, à quel point euh, le crime de Violette Nozière a été hors norme pour comprendre hein, le, le retentissement euh, de cette affaire euh, au cœur des années 30. Alors, d'abord, c'est un parricide. Et le parricide, hein, c'est un crime qui est au sommet de la hiérarchie euh, criminelle. Et puis, comment a-t-elle commis son crime L'empoisonnement le, le, est un crime réputé euh, lâche, qui implique une trahison, hein, puisque euh, on empoisonne à l'intérieur de la famille, le poison ne se voit pas, donc il implique de l'hypocrisie, etc. Donc c'est un, un crime euh, qui, dans l'imaginaire collectif, si vous voulez, est, euh, chargé, est, est véritablement chargé d'horreur. Hein. Et puis par ailleurs, il y a le contraste hein, entre l'énormité du crime et, pour le coup, la, la personnalité de Violette, qui est une jeune fille, qui est à la fois donc une femme et une enfant. Hein. C'est à la fois l'âge et le sexe. 
il y a la préméditation, hein. euh, il y a euh, l'insensibilité de Violette, qui, en fait, au lendemain du crime, hein, est allée danser. Donc voilà, ça c'est des détails hein, qui ont paru euh, constituer un crime euh, proprement monstrueux. The preparations for the case last four months, taking until January 1934. When Violette is accused of theft and prostitution, she explains that her money came from a mysterious protector named Emile. She gives a succinct description. Aged around 60, he's tall, of average build, white hair, and a mustache sculpted in the American style. He's an industrialist, married with three children. Unfortunately, she doesn't know his surname. He gives me 3,000 francs a month, she adds. When Judge Lenoir tells her that she has not given enough information, she adds that he has a blue Talbot brand car. The police begin their search for Emile. 160,000 cars were registered in the previous two months in the Seine region. Among them are 33 Talbots owned by men named Emile, eight of which are between the ages of 55 and 70, and two of whom correspond to the physical description, Emile Michelet and Emile Hiddelfinger, but the latter has a dark gray car. That just leaves Michelet, But when the police present Violette with his photo, she claims she's never seen him before. Is this another of her lies? In any case, the enigmatic Emile will never be found. The investigation continues, and Violette continues to claim that it was the incest that made her do it. Le juge d'instruction a enquêté mais il cherchait des preuves, on va dire, matérielles. Il cherchait des témoins. Et dans ces affaires-là, ben, des preuves matérielles, il euh, n'y en a pas. Hein? Et puis, quand même, euh, l'enquête a abouti à, à des faits assez troublants. Hein? Euh, C'est-à-dire les confidences que Violette a faites à des camarades. Et puis aussi une perquisition. La perquisition au domicile des nausières, euh, finalement, a conduit à trouver un chiffon taché de sperme qui, euh, a dit Violette, servait à son père hein, euh, pour ne pas l'engrosser. On a trouvé aussi des illustrations pornographiques dans la chambre du père. Donc finalement, ce père n'était peut-être pas aussi respectable qu'on l'a dit. Qui a cru Violette à ce moment-là Eh bien, les surréalistes. Et ça, c'est une intervention qui est tout à fait euh, étonnante. 17 surrealists composed a collection which appeared in December 1933, on which there are the signatures of André Breton, René Char, Salvador Dali, Paul Eluard, René Magritte, Alberto Giacometti, and many other intellectuals. Ce recueil rassemble euh, huit textes poétiques, huit dessins, avec en couverture la photographie de Man Ray, euh, représente un bouquet de violettes fraîches, par-dessus la lettre N, brisée, donc l'initiale du père. Que dit la couverture La couverture dit le viol et dit l'inceste. Hein l'initiale brisée du père, euh, la fraîcheur, l'innocence euh, saccagée. Hein? Donc voilà, les surréalistes disent « Violette a dit vrai » et ils dénoncent le tabou de l'inceste. Et ce qui est tout à fait intéressant, c'est que si on compare le texte de presse et le texte poétique, hein, c'est que là où la presse parle au figuré, fait des périphrases, ne dit jamais l'inceste, ne dit jamais viol, mais dit cette monstrueuse accusation, etc. Hein? Eh bien, euh, les surréalistes emploient un langage très cru. Hein? Le petit papa qui violait. Donc, des mots très crus pour dénoncer l'inceste. Et en dénonçant l'inceste, c'est toute la société. Hein? Une société des pères, une société de l'autorité, une société des vieux. Hein, euh, que dénoncent les surréalistes. 
However, this pressure from intellectuals and artists doesn't alter Judge Lenoir's assessment or change public opinion. October 10, 1934, 14 months after the crime, the trial finally starts. The day before the trial, Alexander I of Yugoslavia is assassinated by a Croatian Ustaz group led by Ante Pavlic in Marseille. It's an international tragedy that will make the headlines round the world, but nothing distracts the crowd gathered outside the courtroom to catch a glimpse of the infamous poisoner. There is complete silence as Violette Nozier enters the courtroom. Le procès intervient un an après le crime. Il y a eu tout un personnage monstrueux et diabolique qui a été construit dans l'opinion hein, pendant tout le temps euh, de l'instruction. Alors quand le procès euh, démarre, il y a beaucoup d'attentes. On a envie de voir Violette Nozière. Et bien Violette Nozière déçoit. On s'attendait à une femme fatale, si vous voulez. Hein, à la ténébreuse empoisonneuse. Qu'est-ce qu'on a sous les yeux On a une jeune femme de 19 ans fatiguée par la prison. Tout à fait ordinaire. While the accusations are being read out, Violette doesn't move. Her face is pale, expressionless. Judge Pear addresses her. Will the accused please stand? It is a personality trait of yours to lie. You lied for a long time to your parents, your friends, your lovers. Today, you are here before those who will judge you. Have you decided to tell the truth? Yes, sir, she responds. Pear describes the crime, and at the description of the fatal moment when her parents drank the poison, Violette lets out a low cry and collapses on the floor, wailing. She's taken out of the room, and the court doctor gives her a shot to calm her down. The next day, the moment that Violette has been dreading arrives, when her mother takes the stand. On va dire qu'il y a eu deux moments, deux moments particulièrement forts dans, dans le procès de Violaine Nozière. C'est le premier, c'est la venue de sa mère, qui a survécu donc à la au crime, qui a survécu donc à l'empoisonnement et euh, au gaz, puisque Violette avait ouvert le gaz pour parachever son, son meurtre, son double meurtre. Mais bon, sa mère, a, sa mère a survécu et tout le monde se rappelait qu'elle avait eu des paroles très, très lourdes pour sa fille. Elle avait dit qu'elle lui pardonnerait quand elle serait morte sur son lit, sur son lit d'hôpital. Et on s'imaginait évidemment que la mère allait arriver, demander, demander un châtiment terrible pour sa fille. Et pas du tout, c'est l'inverse qui se produit, c'est une mère éplorée qui pardonne à sa fille devant les spectateurs médusés, qui demande pitié pour son enfant au, au procureur et au, et au président et au juré. Donc voilà un retournement de situation absolument enfin, qu'on qu n'aurait qu pas du tout prédit quelques, quelques jours, même quelques heures plus tôt. At the end of Madame Nozier's deposition, the president asks Violette if she has anything to say. She simply turns to her mother and cries, Mommy! Mommy! Her mother takes her in her arms and tells her that she can't forget that she is her daughter. What you said about your father is an atrocious lie, but I cannot forget that you are my child. As she leaves the courtroom, Madame Nozier turns to the jurors and begs one last time for them to show mercy for her child. The witnesses come one after the other without revealing anything new, and then it's time for the defense to make its closing argument. Mr. Boitel, the counsel for the plaintiff, reiterates Madame Nozier's message and asks the jurors to show mercy for the child. But the prosecuting attorney's argument is formidable. Violette Nozier's crime does not allow for the least degree of sympathy or leniency. I ask you, gentlemen of the jury, to give her the death penalty. Mr. Vecine Leroux, 
Violette's lawyer knows he can't do much. And in his closing statement, he tries to condemn her parents, saying they had pushed her to reach an ideal that was impossible, leaving her to be corrupted in the debauched Latin Quarter. He concludes by saying, The responsibility is with those in authority because they have the duty to use it properly. That is why it is the parents of Violette Nozier who are primarily responsible for the faults of their daughter. I ask you to forgive the guilty child. The jurors leave to deliberate, but they aren't gone for long. Just one hour later, they return. No mitigating circumstances are conceded, and Violette Nozier is condemned to death. Violette listens without showing any emotion, and then, suddenly, she turns to the court and cries, I told you the truth. It's shameful. You are heartless. She is removed from the courtroom by force. Il faut quand même avoir en tête que Violette Nozière est une femme qui a tué un homme, qui a été arrêtée par des hommes, qui a été euh, interrogée et entendue par des hommes, qui a été défendue par des hommes, qui a été jugée par des hommes. Parce qu'on est à une époque hein, où euh, les femmes sont exclues du monde judiciaire. Il y a des avocates, mais il n'y a pas de femmes magistrats, euh, il n'y a pas de femmes jurées. D'accord Donc ça, c'est aussi un élément important. Donc, si vous voulez, euh, Violette, elle a été condamnée par une justice d'homme et par une justice de père. Et je crois que, voilà, une justice des pères a euh, euh, lavé nos hier. Hein et, voilà. A proclamé l'innocence du père. Violette is locked up in the Roquette prison in a cell on the second floor that is well lit all day and night. She's under the surveillance of Sister Leonid. She benefits from a privileged routine reserved for those condemned to death. She's not forced to work and is fed well and allowed a daily 45-minute walk. On December 6th, Mr. Vecin Leroux appeals for clemency to the President of the Republic, Albert Lebrun. At that time, women are no longer being executed. Clemency was granted on Christmas Day, and her sentence was commuted to forced labor for life. January 14, 1935, a convoy of 14 women chained together leaves the Roquette prison at dawn, taking them to the Hogno prison in the Vosges region. Violette is among them. The Hagenau prison is like a fortress. Four sandstone Vosges-style buildings surrounded by a wall several meters thick. The prison is sinister. The 14 condemned women are locked in what the administration called chicken cages, thanks to their grilled ceilings. All the doors of the cages close at the same time, thanks to a huge iron bar on the edge of each. The prisoners are forced to stay completely silent. They're not allowed to talk to each other. They are alone with themselves. Je crois qu'il faut rappeler que les conditions de détention étaient infiniment plus dures alors qu'elles ne le sont aujourd'hui. D'abord, les remises de peine étaient rares. Et euh, condamné à perpétuité, ça voulait vraiment dire, la plupart du temps, terminer sa vie en prison. D'autre part, le travail était obligatoire, les conditions de détention extrêmement spartiates. Violette Nozière, qui a à peine 20 ans, et qui a pour perspective de passer tout le reste de son existence dans cet univers, commence à purger sa peine. Et quelques semaines après son arrivée à Agno, Il lui arrive quelque chose qui va bouleverser sa vie. Elle retrouve la foi. 
au cours de la messe dominicale à la chapelle de la prison, brusquement, elle expérimente ce qu'on appelle une métanoïa, c'est-à-dire une conversion totale de son être, et cette foi va euh, lui rendre la paix avec elle-même, va l'aider à supporter sa vie très dure et va l'aider à se réconcilier avec son passé. Violette est un modèle prisonnier et très rapidement, elle devient un bon exemple pour les autres prisonniers. Her lawyer comes to see her regularly, as does her mother. She makes the grueling journey every month to Hagno, saying that she knows that Violette needs her. In October 1937, four years after her crime, Violette sends a letter to her mother, in which she officially retracts all accusations that she made against her father. She declares that she had only made these accusations to try and clear herself. The woman of 1937 is not the same person as the girl of 1933. The years pass, and on May 10, 1940, seven months after France and England's declaring war on Germany, Hitler sends his army to Holland, Belgium, and France. Violette est transférée à prison en Rennes. C'est une autre femme. C'est une autre femme, une prisonnière modèle. Malgré une santé très mauvaise, elle est euh, irréprochable sur le plan de la discipline, de l'ardeur au travail. Et elle parle autour d'elle de euh, si un jour elle sort de prison, elle pourrait devenir religieuse. Elle attire l'attention des aumôniers de prison, qui sont des Dominicains. Et, par un heureux hasard, le père Sertillange, un célèbre philosophe dominicain, connaît personnellement le maréchal Pétain, chef de l'État français, qui, en 1942, lui accorde un cadeau inestimable. Il ramène sa peine à 12 ans de prison. August 6, 1942. Violette has only three years left to serve. She leaves her job at the laundry, begins a training course, and is put to work in the prison's accounting office. This leads to an encounter that will change her life. The accountant has a son, Pierre, 23 years old, and Violette falls in love. Her feelings are reciprocated. Pierre tells his father that she is an extraordinary girl. August 29, 1945. Violette Nozier, former prisoner number 9517, is freed. She leaves through the heavy gates of Wren Prison, accompanied by a smiling young man carrying her suitcase. Violette and Pierre Granier will go on to build a new life together. However, although she is a free woman, Violette is still banned from entering 60 different regions of France. November 15, 1945, General de Gaulle, president of the provisional government, signs a decree lifting the travel ban imposed on Violette. Thanks mainly to Mr. Vizine Leroux, who for 12 years worked tirelessly to try and reduce Violette's sentence. Thanks to his work, three heads of state studied her case and exercised their rights to pardon. President Albert Lebrun in 1934, Philippe Patin in 1942, and Charles de Gaulle in 1945. This makes Violette Nozier's case unique in the legal history books. The young woman who left prison age 30 goes on to marry on the 16th of December 1946. Some people in the village are still shocked by her crime. So the couple leave for Paris very shortly after the ceremony. They're accompanied by Violette's mother, who will stay with her for the rest of her days. Le personnage de Violette Nozière s'inverse complètement. On avait l'empoisonneuse, qu'est-ce qu'on a On a la mère nourricière. Et ça, c'est fabuleux, parce que pourquoi la figure de l'empoisonneuse est si importante dans l'imaginaire du crime hein, Et pourquoi c'est une, une figure qui terrifie C'est parce que l'empoisonneuse est le contraire hein, de la femme 
pensée comme nourricière. Hein. Et là, Violette, elle a cinq enfants. Et elle s'est consacrée hein, à l'éducation de ses cinq enfants. Violette était une jeune oisive dans le quartier latin. Elle est devenue une travailleuse acharnée. Violette et son mari buy un hôtel restaurant in Orn. They make the business into a success and it thrives for over 10 years. Sadly, in 1961, Pierre dies in a car accident. Violette continues to courageously bring up her five children and to manage her business. On March 18, 1963, Violette receives a phone call from Mr. Vizine Leroux. He announces triumphantly that the Rouen court has just announced her rehabilitation. This is the first time in the history of France's legal system that the perpetrator of a crime in common law is rehabilitated after having originally been sentenced to death. Que Violette Nozière ait été réhabilitée ne veut pas dire qu'elle ait été considérée comme innocente hein, du crime euh, pour lequel elle a été condamnée. La réhabilitation efface la peine, c'est-à-dire que dans le casier judiciaire, il n'y aura pas mention de sa condamnation. Et euh, Violette Nozière, si vous voulez, euh, a, disait-elle, voulu protéger les enfants euh, de son secret, puisque ces enfants n'étaient pas du tout au courant de la première vie euh, de leur maman. Her criminal record has been cleared, but the very same year, she finds out that she has cancer. On November 18th, 1966, Violette calls her daughter Michelle to her bedside. In eight days, it'll all be over, she tells her. And when I'm no longer here, you must look after grandmother. You must never abandon her. Violette also adds that in the basement, there is a small green suitcase full of letters and papers. She asks that they be burnt without being read. November 28, 1966, at 2.30 a.m., Violette dies with her daughter Michelle and her mother at her bedside. Germaine Nozier holds her daughter's hand and pleads with her not to leave her again and make her unhappy. But Violette dies, aged 51. Michelle keeps her promise and burns the papers and letters inside the green suitcase without even looking at them. Michelle and her siblings will take tender care of their grandmother, Germaine, until her death on August 4th, 1968, when she's 80 years old. Violette ended up being forgiven by everyone, and she remains an example of successful rehabilitation. Mr. Vassine LaRue said that, if in 1934 the death penalty had not been abolished for women, Violette would have been executed, taking with her unusual abilities of repentance and redemption. Today, she lies in rest in the family vault in Neuville-sur-Loire, between her husband, her mother, and her father. <laughs>